Yeah, Liam, thank you for this. I think this is absolutely vital. I can't help but feel as though there's quite a lot of heavy-duty spin going on here. Like, look, this is great. We've smashed our target of the amount of foreign students we're getting in light of these net migration figures. But it all seems palatable if there's a serious, massive economic benefit. Is there? OK, this is a, this is a classic double-edged sword, OK? On the one hand, the UK boasts most of the world-class universities in Western Europe, mm. right? We are second only to the United States in the world in terms of the number of incredible institutes of higher education that we have. And undoubtedly, there are towns and cities around the country where students play an absolutely vital role in the local economy, be it Bristol, Exeter, mm. Newcastle, uh, towns and cities in the Midlands. Education, Patrick, is, under some definitions, our third biggest export sector after financial services and pharmaceuticals. So it is massive, massive money. On the other hand, mm -hmm. looking at the other end side of the sword, the aspect of it that you are bearing down on completely rightly is are the numbers and what people actually do mm -hmm. after they graduate and whether or not higher education is being used as a sort of back door to jump the immigration queue so you don't actually need work visas. Mm. And that's why some people have taken umbrage when uh, the Education Secretary says she's hugely proud of 600,000. Given that, we're probably looking at a migration number of 700,000 in total, a big chunk of that taken up by students. Of, of course, that's a net migration yeah. figure. Let's just have a look at some of the numbers yeah. here. I've put them in a graphic. So we are now at this total of 600,000 student visas being granted a year. That target has been met eight years earlier. It was meant to be 2030. And the number of dependents really is quite interesting. In 2019, there were 16,000 dependents, so spouses and or children of students in 2019. Look at that now. In 2022, 135,800. Wow. That's a huge uptick. And some people would say, you know, whoever took their mum to college. Yeah. On the other hand, if a student, a postgraduate student is coming over and he or she is married, why shouldn't they be entitled to bring their wife and mm. kids? Look, higher education is an enormously powerful lobby. It's an enormously powerful vested interest, Patrick. University vice-chancellors, many of them on huge salaries, by the way, have been lobbying government for years and years and years to take student visas out of the immigration numbers. That's still... Uh, an active debate. Mm. What also is another kind of twist in this debate is it's increasingly clear that even some of our really, really top universities, Oxbridge and the Russell, so-called Russell Group universities, the ones that Brit many British students aspire to get to, they're actually favouring foreign students over homegrown students because foreign students, of course, pay much, much higher mm. fees. And there's more than anecdotal evidence now that this is happening. Chinese students make up a quarter of all foreign students. And in some of our top institutions, foreign students are now between 20 and 30 percent of the entire wow. student body. So for my Planet Normal podcast I do for The Telegraph, I get so many emails from mums and dads and indeed from students saying, look, I've got nine A stars yeah. at GCSE, or, or nines as they're now called. Yeah. I've got four A stars at A level. Yeah. And every single, you know, forget Oxford and Cambridge, every single Russell Group University I've applied to, I'm not getting a look in. Yeah. But the Chinese kids at my school are getting a look in. So yeah. what's happening? Yeah, well, exactly that. And there's this... And it is actually a misconception, OK? This line that is put out a heck of a lot of times by people, which is that, oh, well, it's all right, because the vast majority of these students go home, OK? But actually, the idea that only a small minority overstay their visa or, or legally choose to remain, uh, that claim would make it palatable, I think, for a lot of people, if, you know, when you look at these numbers. But just have a look at this. This is a quote from the Office for National Statistics. There are no official figures that show how mm. many students do not emigrate and remain in the UK after their studies. And in every year since 2012, around 100,000 more student immigrants have arrived than former student immigrants have left. So if you extrapolate all of that out, clearly, therefore, there is the yeah. potential for a huge amount of people, year on year, to be staying. And so I think it would be be wrong to take that out of our net migration figures, probably. And that is a very active debate, and expect that debate to go, you know, ballistic over the next six to 12 months as really, really high net immigration figures come to the fore. 
Look, it is a really, really difficult situation. If you are attracting really good students from around the world and they come to a good university here, they do maybe a scientific degree uh, or they train as a medic or something, and then they stay here, they are going to add massively yeah. to the economy. But if you get people coming here and they're doing, quotes, Mickey Mouse degrees from lesser universities that don't have much vocational value and then they stay anyway, are they going to add... An, an, end up adding as much to the economy. And they're dependent. It, it sounds kind of heartless to talk about people in these transactional terms, but this is what a points-based immigration system is about. It's meant to be a filter on the quality as well as the quantity of people who come to this country. And at a time when public services are so stretched, when the housing shortage is so chronic and coming to the fore, when people can't get GP appointments, when the NHS has a 7 million plus waiting list, yep. these issues are bound to be very, very politically contentious. And that's why the Education Secretary's statement there, I agree with you, it does sound kind of tin-eared yeah. not, to, not to at least acknowledge the other side of the argument that you and I have been discussing here Absolutely. today. Absolutely, and that's before as well we talk about there, the ability for universities to ramp up their fees, etc. A lot of people may never pay back their student loan or it will take them a heck of a long time in order to do that. And those, those fees can be maintained at a very high level if they know that they can basically scoop up the world's students. Now, what a lot of vice-chancellors would say, many of them on sort of two, three, four, yeah. five hundred grand plus, taking no risk, going to a few meetings every yeah. year, don't at me, it's true. <laughs> what a lot of them would say, ah, oh, but if we didn't have all these foreign students, we'd have to charge homegrown students a lot more. Mm. And there is something in that argument mm -hmm. as well, because the overseas students are subsidising a lot of the domestic students, particularly in the sciences, which are much, much more yeah. expensive to teach than humanities and the arts, where you just sort of sit around yeah. talking and, and write essays. When you've got labs and practicals, that's really, really expensive. So the, the vice-chancellors have got an argument on, yeah. in that sense. On the other hand, if a lot of those people are staying when they shouldn't be staying, it's taxpayers it's as a whole, many of whom don't go to university, who are then subsidising exactly. that system. Yeah. And, and we, we need clarity, really. When you look at these numbers, and you've got a, a, a Secretary of State there greeting this with glee and delight, we, I think, deserve a bit of clarity on, well, actually, have you got the numbers on how many people are staying? Have you got the numbers on how many of their dependents are hanging around as well and what they're contributing to the economy? And what are the courses and what are the jobs that these people are getting if they are staying? And, and at, at the moment, it's incredibly difficult to find the answers to those questions. Even it, very specialised researchers yeah. struggle to get the extract these numbers from the national accounts and even the boffins at the ONS are revealing that very pertinent numbers and variables aren't even being collected to even begin yeah. the national debate on these issues look when these it's a massive day it's a massive week for data next week we've got the inflation yeah. number on Wednesday and then we've got this immigration number on Thursday so on Thursday expect yeah. a huge amount of debate about the number of Ukrainians the number of Hong Kong Chinese yeah. come to the UK, uh, the number of students who have come to the UK and the complete switch from EU-derived immigration into yeah. the UK towards non-EU-derived De derived immigration into yeah. the UK. So yeah, you're, a very, you're very, right. very interesting day. M massive, um, very interesting week. And of course, we are indeed the place to watch it. Liam, thank you, mate. That was great stuff. Liam Halligan, our economics and business editor with On the Money. 